Um, so, um, welcome everybody. Thanks for attending. Um, I hope you get a lot out of tonight's session. As I said, it is being recorded and will be made available to you after the event on our webpage and we'll also send you a link once it's um, ready to go. So um, before we begin today, I'd just like to say that I am presenting this webinar from the lands of the Wurundjeri people and I wish to acknowledge them as traditional owners. I would also like to pay my respects to their elders past and present and Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be here today. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Michelle Hanslow. I am an Environment Project Officer at Nellenbeek Shire Council and I started working about three years ago as the Biodiversity Officer, but for the last two to three years I have been managing three different deer projects uh, focused on deer control and education and engagement. So today's presentation is part of our Collaborative Community Deer Control Project, which is funded by a Communities Environment Program grant from the federal government. Um, and so tonight is uh, the first of at least six deer events that we're running for uh, 2021, probably finishing up end of June. And we'll be focusing tonight on identification and monitoring of deer, deer signs and damage. And it is interactive. You'll be able to talk to us rather than just type questions into the chat. Um, but please do write your questions in there so that we know that uh, we've got a question that someone wants answered. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, just some basic housekeeping. Please turn off your audio and video if you're not presenting or asking a question. That would be great. Uh, so uh, before I get on to my section of the night, I'd just like to uh, introduce our special guests for tonight. Uh, we have Richard Francis from Obseco. He's a, an ecologist and also one of Council's deer controllers. And so he can talk very broadly about the ecological impacts of deer whilst also being a good tracker of deer. So he's well placed to teach us about identification. Uh, we have Sam Gilbert, for, uh, Biodiversity Officer at uh, Manningham Council. And Tracy Wood, who is the President of the Jumping Creek Catchment Land Care Group. And the lovely Steph Orive is our Land Management Officer at Council and she'll be helping out with the questions and all the tech issue and letting people in. So thanks everyone for helping me out tonight. <clears throat> so tonight what we will cover, um, why we need to monitor and the basic survey techniques. Uh, Rich will help us to identify the different deer species uh, and where we're likely to see signs of the deer and how to recognise them. And then he'll also cover how to set up cameras on your property to capture deer sightings. Sam and Tracy will then tell us about the deer monitoring and control programs at Manningham Council and talk about their camera trapping and vegetation um, plot surveys in particular. I think they might also walk transects to spot deer or poop. I'm not sure. We'll find out. Uh, then I will talk very briefly about some other monitoring methods, including drone, uh, thermal drone surveys and Nilambic's deer monitoring protocol, which is very basic. Um, and finally, we'll cover how to record your deer sightings in deer scan or other options. Um, and we will have a Q&A live discussion after that. In between each of those sections too, we will have time for a couple of questions so um, <clears throat> that they're answered as we go. Okay, so uh, as I said, feel free to ask those questions in the comments section or raise your hand and we will ask you to speak. Okay, so uh, shall we get started? Okay, so why do we want to monitor deer? Uh, well, deer numbers are continuing to rise. Samba populations can double every three years. So we want to monitor to find out whether there are deer in the area or on your property, as we want to prevent their arrival and eradicate any new incursions that we find. We want to estimate deer populations if that's possible, uh, or to track if the population is increasing or decreasing and whether there are more males and females, what the ratio is. We want to ascertain whether control is reducing numbers and is effective or whether the deer are simply moving elsewhere. We also want to find out how long it takes for deer to return or for new deer to arrive after a control program has taken place. We want to determine 
how many deer can be tolerated in a particular area before the damage to the vegetation is so great that we no longer have enough food in the environment to sustain the deer or any other of our native animals. So that's the carrying capacity, which is the little graph here. Uh, and we do not know what the carrying capacities might be in our local environment, but given that we have such small isolated patches of vegetation for the most part here, the likelihood of damage with even just a few deer is pretty likely. And the final reason we might want to monitor is to get funding. So the government need to know that we do have deer here, in fact, pretty much everywhere, and they need to know in what numbers so that they can understand that deer are not just causing issues in high biodiversity areas or in alpine bogs, but they're causing havoc in urban areas, in farmland and in our last remnant patches of bushland. And we want to avoid this. Sorry, Michelle. Yep. We've got a hiccup. Um, Frank, can you stop screen sharing, please? Sorry. <laughs> I can't see that. Really? <laughs> Everyone else can see it. That's uh, amazing. Can I, can I see um, what I'm looking at? Are we good to go? No. No. Try sharing over the top of him, Michelle. Mm. <laughs> okay back on you're back thank you all right what did we miss anything exciting <laughs> if you go back one slide to your graphs oh. okay yeah. there we go all right so uh, the charts just showing the increase in uh, sandbar populations. So they are said to double every three years, and this is our carrying capacity where the deer number is going up and then running out of vegetation and crashing. Okay, um, I guess we heard all the, the blurbs, so I won't go over that again. No. So what we are trying to avoid is this scenario of uh, this huge mob of uh, deer that we had at um, Sugarloaf Reservoir back in July last year. Uh, we want to avoid seeing that on any of our properties. Okay, so what do we monitor? Well, there's a number of ways that deer can be monitored. Uh, we can use direct or indirect methods um, on site or remotely. So to find direct signs, so that's looking for deer itself or scats, hair or prints, we can walk transects, use wildlife cameras, thermal drone surveys, or we might just see deer or their signs whilst going for a walk. And indirect signs are things like damage to vegetation, waterways or our assets, and we might find them randomly or accidentally, but for a more systematic approach, then vegetation monitoring plots is one way to go. So this is uh, image is just showing um, <clears throat> some ring barking of trees uh, out in St Andrews, and that can actually cause the death of the tree. Um, rose bushes being decimated and this image of the bushland is just demonstrating that you can just lose the complete mid-story or ground story and end up with quite open forests. Okay, so uh, now Richard will tell us actually how to identify the different deer species, uh, where we might be likely to see them and their signs and how to recognise those signs, tell apart all the poops. And then you'll go on to talk to us about setting up cameras. So I will just end my show there and hopefully um, hand over to Richard. Seamless, absolutely seamless. Okay, so can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. All right. So welcome everyone. As Michelle said, my name's Richard. I'm a consultant based in Eltham. I do environmental surveys and assessment, and I also do some deer control and harvesting. Okay, so I've been asked to talk about identifying deer, um, identifying damage from deer and comparing that from other species, and also some ways in which to monitor. 
So the photo we're looking at here, of course, is clearly some damage from deer. This is the head of a dam on a private property in Nillimbik in North Warrandyte. And these pools that you see at the head of the dam are wallows made by deer, in this case, sandbar deer. They particularly like to wallow. Uh, it's very common to see deer prints around dams in Nillimbik. In fact, um, it's if you want to get a bit of an idea of deer activity in any given area, going to a dam is a really good um, indicator because you, you get prints and you can tell quite quickly whether or not those prints are fresh or not. Um, and if you go to a dam regularly, you get a really good idea of uh, how often deer are visiting. Obviously, from the prints around this one, pretty regular. Okay. So in, in Nilbic and the surrounding areas in Perry urban Melbourne, there's three dominant species that we see. Um, fallow deer, red deer and sandbar deer. They're all quite distinct. And if you see them up relatively close during the day, they're quite easy to tell apart. Um, but of course, deer don't always have antlers. I mean, male deer shed their antlers every year and female deer, uh, well, they don't ever have antlers. So what are the key characteristics for telling them apart? Sandbar deer and red deer are much bigger than fallow deer. So even though these photos are all aren't proportional, fallow deer are around 40 kilos, uh, more like the size of a, you know, a, a large dog. Sandbar deer are up over 200 kilos, a large animal. So they're quite different in size. Red deer are similarly a large animal in that they're quite tall. They're just not quite as heavy bodied as the sandbar. So fallow deer are quite easy to tell apart from the other deer purely based on size. Um, the other thing to note is that they have quite pointy small ears and often fallow deer occur in herds or uh, there might be small numbers um, but it can be up to several hundred in a herd particularly out in East Gippsland. Sambar deer and red deer can be tricky to tell apart because they're a similar size and their colouring is quite similar too. Sambar deer have a very large satellite like ears, they're quite round um, and the red deer have more. Get up and answer it. I'm now. listening to something, okay? It's Christopher, so, I was standing next to the phone. Right, that's interesting. <laughs> Shall we mute all? <laughs> um, Sorry, I'll keep an eye on the uh, offending person. <laughs> okay, cool. So, and the red deer have quite pointy ears, quite long. So if you see a deer in your headlights, you know, first stop, but look at its ears, that can tell you a lot about it. Um, Sandbar deer do tend to be quite shaggy in their coat and darker, more of a browny colour, um, whereas the red deer, they're taller, leaner, and tend to not have such a shaggy coat on it. Um, something they say about Sandbar is they have a bit of a mane below their neck, so another diagnostic character that can be useful. Okay. Um, the antlers. We can see in these diagrams, the antlers are very different. Samba deer never have more than three tines, that's three points on an antler. Red deer can have many points. Um, and so if you see a stag, quickly you can tell the difference between a samba and a red deer. I stay, I stay unmuted. Yep. Unmute. Definitely stay muted. Uh, fallow deer have quite palmate antlers, they call it. So like big hands, big flat hands. Okay. 
this is a good diagram to show the various antlers. <sighs> Identifying deer from their tracks is, is very difficult. And it's something that I still have some trouble with. Particularly because it depends whether the animal is a very large animal or a small animal, whether it's walking slowly or walking quickly. Um, it's something that uh, takes some practice and it certainly helps if you know what deer you have in your area and you get to know um, what you've got locally and at, when you travel interstate and you, you look at other tracks, you can start to pick out the differences. One of the key things with sandbar deer and red deer is the sandbar are really quite uniform. Their, their prints have these two fairly parallel toes and they are a bit more um, pointed at the end, a little bit more pointed, but still quite rounded. Whereas um, the red deer come to a more defined point. But really, I find it quite difficult. I mean, these two prints, both in soft sand, ideal conditions, I, it is hard to tell them apart. So not a very good diagnostic character, much better to see the animal. Um, I recommend the best way to identify what deer are in an area is a game camera, and we'll get to that shortly. Uh, scats for telling deer apart, again, quite challenging. Um, fresh scats are better than older scats. Uh, fallow deer scats are very small. They're very similar to the other deer species, but much smaller. But then, of course, you may have a, a, a juvenile sandbar or a juvenile red deer. Their scats are also very small, which makes it very challenging. Um, so what I, I guess one of the things I've found is the sandbar deer to tend to have a much flatter end uh, at one end and then a point at the other. It's a, it's both ends and uh, it's not particularly pointy, it's just got a very small kind of tip on it. The red deer scats um, are much more rounded. They don't have as flat a base. Um, when I come across deer in the bush, it's very common that I don't actually see them. Um, and a lot of people, uh, they tell me that they have had some quite disturbing experiences with deer calls, catching them off guard, walking to put their, uh, their bin out or going out for a walk in one of the various parks. Sandbar deer have a very uh, powerful bark-like call that, um, I don't know, can people hear that? Uh, no, the... Um, oh, same uh, problem as you had the other day. It worked when I tested it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so sandbar deer, they turn their um, face towards the direction they think there's a disturbance coming from, and they let out a very loud uh, bark-like call, very short and powerful. It can be quite disorienting if the animal's quite close. And it's very common around the Olympic to come across sandbar and dense vegetation. Uh, red deer have a very different call, much like a, more, a long bellowing like call uh, and fellow are different again. I don't often hear fallow deer calling unless it's at night during the rut. Um, unlike uh, sandbar that tend to um, stand very motionless, when they think someone's approaching and they will make this loud call before running off, sometimes only a short distance. Uh, sandbar rely a lot on the cover provided by the vegetation they're in. Uh, here's a few more examples of signs of deer. Um, hair on fences is a very common one and antler rubbing. Game trails are becoming more and more of an issue 
in our vegetation uh, and they're very easy to find. Uh, of course, kangaroos and wallabies also use the same game trails. Uh, we, I tend to find animals concentrate on particular tracks and we end up with these really deep, well-worn trails through our vegetation. All around Nillambic, we can see signs of deer activity. There's two particular browsing signs that tell us that deer numbers are quite high in a given area. One of these is what's called excessive hedging, where a plant is really pruned down really short, and another is browse lines where plants are really high. So at deer height, as you're going around your property, you might notice that there's a lot of uh, trees that are browsed to about one and a half to two metres in height. Um, deer browse a lot of shrubs. They only have teeth on the bottom at the front. So their incisors at the front are only on the bottom, not on the top. So they tend to crush. I, um, I have a skull here. And this is a sandbar skull, it's got three tines. And you can see there's no front teeth at all on the top. So on the bottom jaw, they have very sharp teeth, which means that they tend to cut from the bottom and then pull their head backwards, causing this very clearly damaged end. It's very different for something like a rabbit, a wallaby or a kangaroo. They've got teeth on the top and the bottom. So when you see damage to plants, if it is, uh, has got tags on the end or appears to be crushed, not clearly cut, that's most likely to be a deer causing that damage. And if you think about the height at which the damage is, the damage on this tree trunk, for example, is from antlers, that's over two metres up a tree. So we're looking at quite a large animal there. Um, Kangaroos will also cause damage to tree trunks. Um, they'll scratch on tree trunks, but it tends to be very localised, unlike deer damage. OK, well, I'm glad I got through that. Uh, Stephanie, are there any questions that I should be answering about this at this stage? No, no questions yet. I think everyone is just absorbing the information. I'm, yeah, loving it. Good to hear. Cameras, OK. I know we're going to hear a bit about cameras tonight. So what I'll do is I'll tell you about a couple of different cameras that I use and why I use them. Uh, when you're doing monitoring, it's important to consider what it is you're trying to achieve. If you're doing wildlife monitoring, you'll be setting a, a game camera up or a wildlife camera up for that particular species. For example, if you're trying to capture um, native marsupials that move through the vegetation, you'll want to have something like um, some structural habitat, like a log or um, a tree trunk across a particular waterway, um, a, perhaps a dead hollow bearing tree, somewhere where the animals are likely to moving, moving along to get from one place to another. Now, I don't know if everyone's managed to pick up the animal in this photo, but there's actually an eastern pygmy possum. And it is on the left hand side on a branch. So you can see that's illustrating the fact that we've got a native marsupial on a branch. Now this camera wasn't set up particularly well, and that's one of the reasons I have it here. And I'll add, I didn't set it up. So <laughs> what are the issues with this camera? Now it's set up quite well. It was set up actually to monitor for cats in an area that where they're doing cat control for species. It's in Bunyip State Forest. So the person who set this up has chosen 
a little clearing there, you can see, and the camera, it's angled slightly downwards to try and get that clearing. Now, it could well be that there is um, a buried uh, free feed of some sort in there, a lure there to try and attract animals to that. I think the angle of the camera is really good because you're not going to get too much in the periphery. However, what they haven't done is take a photo from that position and look at the photo to see what is in my frame. Because if I was to just blow a little bit like the wind, the branches that we can see there would start to move. So if we got a breeze through this site, all of those branches would move and you could end up with thousands of photos to scroll through on this camera. Um, it might well be it's in the really sheltered gully and it was only up for a short period of time, but um, this is probably the most frustrating thing you have to learn um, is how to set up a camera so that you don't get too many false triggers. The most common false triggers are moving vegetation. Um, people and cars <laughs> had that one a lot. Um, but then there's also the sun. So the sun coming up and casting shadows. And those shadows may be of trees that are blowing in the wind. Uh, it might actually be the sun coming up at one particular time of day and time of year and shining onto your camera. Um, with perhaps a tree also flicking backwards and forwards and turning the sun on and off repetitively. So we need to think about what species we're targeting so that we know what height to put the camera, what angle to put the camera, and where to put the camera. Once we've got that in place, we then have to make sure we're not going to get too many false triggers on our camera. The two ways we manage false triggers are with, by managing the vegetation. So commonly we will take a brush cutter to some sites and actually clear, make a clearing in long grass. We'll take um, pruners with us. To, so the foliage that's in this image here could, be, could have been pruned away quite quickly. It's a great spot for the camera. Shame about the foliage, but we can do something about that foliage just by pruning it away. Even this little shrub in the background here, I'd probably prune that off a bit. Really clear up that area where the camera is. So as I said, this, this camera, I mean, it's not very high, but it's, it's certainly up and it's probably got something stuck behind the camera in order to help it to angle downwards. Uh, it's quite common um, when you're setting up a camera to grab just a, a, a nice size stick and put it behind the camera just to help it get that angle downwards. The other thing you can do is you can change the uh, how sensitive the camera is. And I'll usually test that by moving, um, setting up what I think will be appropriate and then doing a few walk pasts backwards and forwards where I think the edge of my sensitivity is likely to be, where, where I'm likely to start and stop getting images. So I'll walk backwards and forwards. I'll also walk towards the camera and away from the camera uh, a few times. So just kind of walk in towards the camera and um, see where the camera actually starts to pick me up. Now, once you've got your cameras set up, you've got your sensitivities worked out, you've got everything done, um, then you you've, you don't have to do it again. You can be pretty confident that the camera with those settings is going to behave in the same way whenever you set it up. All these cameras save their settings, even if you take batteries out. So um, once it's all good to go, um, you should be able to reliably use it in the same way. The other thing I tend to do is I 
set the cameras up to take three photos uh, a few seconds apart, maybe three seconds apart. Because I have found I sometimes get animals moving slowly and you only get a part of the animal. It's still not in the frame yet. Um, and then after there's been three triggers, I usually set the camera to not take another photo for another minute or so. Because um, if you have a kangaroo sit down in front of your camera and start scratching its ears and um, cleaning itself, you can end up with thousands of photos of a camera clean of a kangaroo cleaning itself. Quite frustrating. Now, another consideration is well, what kind of camera do I need? What we're looking at here is an image from Bunyip State Forest which could be a long way away from where the owner of the camera is. It's quite a different situation for someone who has a rural property and they're putting a camera down the backyard and they, they can go there regularly to, to change the batteries and to download photos. There's a couple of options with cameras. We can go for a camera that has the ability to upload its photos to a website or email them to you or both, like this spy point link micro, micro just here. A pretty cheap, effective option. This one has a built-in uh, SD uh, SIM card and um, you don't have to provide a SIM card. It automatically can connect to the internet as long as there's sufficient signal. It connects up to the spy point network and uploads the photos onto into that website. And you can also set them to email them to you. So you get the copy of a photo immediately or very soon after it's taken. That's very different to the more traditional cameras like this little acorn here that save only to SD card. These cameras are similarly priced and um, similar quality cameras. Um, when it comes to choosing a camera, it's very common that it's the budget that dictates what you end up with. So this is what I would consider to be a well-framed um, photo. The camera is quite high because it's, uh, they're large animals. And in order for me to get it to angle down into an area where there was evidence that deer were feeding on a game trail. So this is a this was a great location for a camera because even if the deer weren't going to feed at this particular location, uh, it is a game trail. And so we'll get them going past or get them feeding. The other reason I chose to have a camera at this site is because it's quite central in this property. And so, and it is a spy point, so it's it's emailing these photos to me as soon as it takes them. This is a property on which we're doing control in uh, Christmas Hills. And so by having a photo on a game trail in a feeding area in a central part of the property, if I get a photo, I know that there's deer there and I can respond. I, if I was out doing control that night, I could reliably visit this property knowing that deer are in a zone where I could undertake control. So that is definitely a consideration. If you're trying to control deer at your house, in your, in your back paddock, having a camera like this, that's between $200 and $300, um, certainly makes it uh, simple to know when you need to go out and start having a look around. So this spot, the camera is positioned very differently. With any camera, the further you get away from the camera, the wider the field of view is. So this camera has been set up only about 30 centimetres from the ground. I did that in order to control how much image I had 
high up because of course trees high up are more likely to move there is quite a bit of vegetation in this photo but it's in a very sheltered location and what i was trying to understand is how often deer were coming to the, this dam to, to drink um, so that i could get a bit of an idea of when i might be able to intercept them on their way between vegetation and the dam for control purposes whenever i have a camera set up on relatively flat ground um, i set it up very low between 30 and 40 centimeters from the ground we don't want to have um, the camera set up really close to where the photo is oh, get that mute button out. thank you um, you want to set it up so that you're taking a photo of an animal that's about th at the closest three meters but preferably around five meters from the camera that way the autofocus works well and also the auto illumination works very well i've found that where you have a camera set up and animals are regularly very close to the camera you get a lot of white out shots uh, more often than you do if you position the camera such a way that the animals are going to be around that five meters around that five meters is also a good distance for having a medium sensitivity rather than a high sensitivity um, this camera i think may actually be on low sensitivity because um, by positioning it the way i have the animals are going to move between that vegetation and the tree that the camera's on so i've got a really fixed length there for detection um, they're going to trigger it okay um stephanie have we got any questions on michelle yes we have one andrew oh. asks once uh, the camera is set up how long do you leave it in the same spot very good question okay well again it depends what you're trying to achieve um, so if you're doing a control program it's a good idea to have the cameras there continuously because you're trying to get a, an idea of whether or not you're either reducing deer numbers or changing their behavior so i tend to leave the cameras out um, until the batteries go flat and then i'll uh, go out and replace them i i like having them continuously running in the field but if you're trying to get some data and um, sam may touch on this because he's doing monitoring um, in a particular area I'll do um, two week slots so that I don't have too many photos to go through because for monitoring purposes you're going to look at every photo on the camera whereas for, for deer control I'm just going to look at the most recent photos um, to see what's been active in the last few days and having something like these spy point cameras well i'm just seeing them as they're taken it's just um uh, just a game changer really i don't have to ever download the sd card i've got them set to wipe the sd card um, so if with these ones you can put quite a lot of batteries in them they can run for a long time i i know a number of people who have particular hunting areas that are several hundred kilometers away from where they live and they monitor them from home so it hmm, depends on the purpose and Richard, I, I have one quick question oh sorry steph um, no, no, no. the camera that was set up at bunya given it was so low down if a deer walked past that would you just be picking up its legs yeah in that situation you would because the way they had that framed with the trees it would be unlikely that a deer would move past in that um, in the correct angle um, 
so they've set it up specifically for cats. And they've put it in, in an area where they expect cats to come and probably centered it with a with a lure. Mm. OK, thanks. Are there any more questions for Richard? No more questions in the chat. Um, so maybe we press on and answer them after the next block. Fantastic. All right. Well, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Richard. I learned a heap from that. Um, next, we have Tracy and Sam to talk about the Manningham Control and Monitoring Program. So I might hand over to Tracy. You can pop your camera and oh, look, she's unmuted and everything. Good to go. <laughs> I'm good to go. That's right. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here. I'm talk going to talk about uh, the Jumping Creek Catchment Land Care Group and Manningham Council's deer, mo deer Monitoring and Culling Program. So sandbar deer have been an issue across Manningham over the last 15 years, with deer numbers and impacts continuing to increase. Over the last few years, however, Deer populations have significantly increased to alarming levels, causing community concerns in relation to environmental and social costs. So, in 2017, Manningham Council and Jumping Creek Catchment Land Care Group initiated a cutting edge deer monitoring and culling program. This was the first of its kind in Melbourne, if not Australia, addressing the effects of escalating deer population numbers in areas of private land in an organised, communal and monitored manner. Together with two leading experts in the field, Drs Amy Bennett and Naomi Davis, a five-year monitoring and cull program with two main aims was developed. So the first one, to guide a shooting program to control deer numbers using a professional deer contractor and to assess the effectiveness of the deer control program in reducing the impacts of deer on native vegetation values. So let me just list the main features of our program. So we had a study area, we have a study area consisting of a treatment site where deer, the deer shooting program is undertaken and a reference site, which is located in Warrenwood Reserve in Maroondah at the top of the Jumping Creek catchment where there is no shooting. 40 cameras are randomly positioned throughout the total study area. 20 are located in the treatment site and 20 in the reference site. The cameras complement the location of the vegetation pot plots as closely as possible. We also have the construction of 15 exclosure plots and 25 reference or open plots with annual vegetation monitoring. We have private landowners participating through a contribution of $350 per property and Manningham Council through its local environmental assistance fund reimburses the program on a one third, two thirds basis. So each participant represents $1,050 worth of deer control. We engage a licensed professional shooter to undertake the cull program. Initially, this was every two weeks, but with breaks over summer and other occasional interruptions, but now it's currently weekly. And we have a very detailed system of permits, protocols, rules and regulations, ensuring best practice and safety for all involved. So what is uh, Jammy Creek Catchment Land Care Group's role in this? Well, we have been there from the beginning. Uh, we deliver community education through holding meetings, producing newsletters, writing articles for the local paper, chatting with neighbours, and we've even contributed to the production of a short video called Deer, the Uninvited Pest, which you can see on Warrandyte TV. We communicate with our members. We had 11 participants in 2017, and uh, we've got over 20 now. We collect the funds from the participants uh, and then we pay the culling contractor and then apply to council for reimbursement. So we look after the monetary side of all that. Uh, we also li liaise closely with Arta Muchow. Many of you would know Arta. He is the uh, network facilitator for Milne. Milne is the Middle Yarra Landcare Network. 
and he uh, ensures that participants and neighbours are informed of culling activity in the area. He, in, he makes sure all the cameras are functional and all the paperwork is fully current and valid. Arta devotes much time to communicating with the contractor about where the shooting is planned and recording the results. For example, he rang me and said last week six deer were culled on one visit, which was which was good, very good numbers. Together with Manningham Council, we have um, had four years, we're in our fourth year now of the program. So Manningham designed the project, obviously, they looked after the cost of that and establishing the protocols. They also provide us with a lot of staff to support the program. They provide staff to conduct the annual vegetation audits of the uh, 40 plots or so. They provide two staff to view over 500,000 camera images and record deer sightings. Um, we, uh, these cameras, as uh, Richard was mentioning before, are movement sensitive and take three immediate shots and then one every five minutes. Now, each picture must be looked at individually in an effort not to count the same deer twice and to recognise the false triggers, as, as Richard mentioned. Uh, so that's a very, very time consuming um, exercise and uh, we're lucky that we've had council support to do that because we, we haven't got the manpower ourselves just as a small land care group. Uh, also, Sam Gilbert, who will be talking after me, the Biodiversity Officer from Manningham Council. He's working alongside us, helping us out, and he's there to oversee, encourage and mentor our land care group's effort. So it certainly is a combined effort. Uh, apart from our valuable statistics, there have been other positive results of our program. Following our lead, there are now more landholders, in, not in our catchment, but in the Middle Yarra Landcare Network, who are independently undertaking deer control. This results in higher culling overall. Uh, now some bordering councils have joined in the fight, for example, Nilambic, with extensive on-ground works and this amazing series of forums. But after four years of monitoring and culling, it is obvious that we've only scratched the surface of this problem. We need more research and knowledge of deer movements. We have experimented with drones and found them not to be effective when the canopy cover is heavy. Roaming devices on deer would be next, along with more frequent culling activity, higher levels of participation from private landholders and greater financial support from government. For me, as president of Jumping Creek Catchment Land Care Group, it is an exciting and worthwhile project. It has been wonderful to see the commitment and hard work of all parties involved, including our committee members. The preservation of the Green Wedge is vitally important, not just to us, but the program participants who have shown loyalty in sticking with us over the years. So a big thank you to all those involved. That's it from me. Now over to Sam, who will talk more specifically about certain aspects of our program, present some results of the camera trap monitoring and delve into a bit of an overview of the vegetation monitoring side of the program. Thank you all. Thanks, Tracy. Um, yeah, that was great and uh, has reduced, you know, the amount that I have to talk about tonight. So thank you very much for that. Um, uh, it was a really good insight into our monitoring and control program. Um, so Tracy's covered a lot of territory there, so I'm basically just going to um, add a little bit to what Tracy's already covered uh, with the camera, tra uh, camera trap monitoring and sort of the purpose of the program. And um, I'll just give everyone a bit of a idea of what's involved in our camera monitoring program. Uh, I'll show some graphs of results and then I'll jump into the vegetation monitoring side of things. So I'll just Share my screen. Okay. So for the camera traps, with regard to our method uh, and work involved, uh, to give you a bit of a basic idea of what this looks like, um, as Tracy mentioned, we have 40 cameras set up across our study area with 20 in each site. Um, 20 in the reference site and 20 across private properties in our control site. And our cameras are spread out as much as possible 
Um, but obviously the distance between cameras is limited by the number of properties involved, the size of the properties and the extent of the vegetation communities present. Um, I'll mention a little bit later about how we um, determine where to place the vegetation plots on the cameras with regard to vegetation communities. So I'll just skip that for now. Um, there's a little picture of a camera set up. So this is just in our reference site. Um, Richard, please don't critique everything about how we set up our cameras, but um, yeah, there it is on the tree. And um, uh, we have uh, 20 of those through the reserve. Um, on our private properties, the spacing's a little bit more liberal um, because there's more space to work with, but for Warren Wood Reserve, anyone that's familiar with it, it's at the top of Jumping Creek catchment in Manningham, uh, in Marinda, sorry, and uh, we're a bit limited by how far apart we can have our cameras. So they're, they're, quite, they're packed quite closely together, um, which isn't ideal really, because you know, if a deer is moving through an area, you're probably going to pick it up a number of times on different cameras. So just to give you, here's a little bit of a flavor of um, some pictures that get uh, captured. So there's a, a stag and that's a, an example of a daytime picture on one of our properties. And um, yeah, there's a picture of a, of a samba at, at night. So that's what the night images would look like. Um, and in terms of the three photos taken in succession, which Tracy mentioned, um, basically the triggers, are, the cameras are set up to trigger three times uh, very quickly. And then there's a gap of five minutes before the next uh, photo is taken. So here's an example of um, two deer moving through the study area. And uh, so when, we, when we're looking at all of the images, um, sometimes there'll be one deer in the first image. And by the time you get to the third image, there might be um, more deer like you can sort of notice in this picture. So we have to make sure we're counting the right amount of deer that we see. Um, so I guess people are a little bit interested in the time involved with this. Um, so in terms of our program, which is um, fairly ambitious uh, to collect the data for each period and to process all of the images, our cameras are left out all year round, um, night and day. So Richard did sort of mention, you know, you can adjust um, how long you set your cameras for um, to determine how much uh, data you're going to have to work through. But at the at the um, inception of the project, uh, it was set up that way, and it's a five year project. We're sort of, you know, through uh, three years, so we don't really want to change how that's happening at the moment. But it does result in a lot of images captured. Um, the way we do it is our year is uh, split into uh, three periods, each of four months. So we found our batteries last four months. Um, so we collect the data and after four months, we shift the cameras to another random but close by location and we change the batteries uh, set up for the next four month period. And a bit of a rough, um, uh, idea of uh, how much time is involved in doing all of this and processing this in people hours. Uh, um, when we're being pretty efficient um, for 40 cameras, we've found that it's about 90 to 100 hours of work uh, for each four month period. So that would depend a lot on the amount of images you have because um, trolling through the images, which a couple of um, uh, people we employ do for us, that um, is very time consuming. Now I'm just going to show uh, a couple of graphs and um, give an idea about some of the results um, from our control program. So this first graph uh, shows data from our professional contractor and it gives an idea of the numbers of deer seen and numbers shot, um, noting that in total 438 deer were seen on contractor visits, um, but only 254 of those deer were shot. And the reason for that is um, obvious to probably any deer contractor out there or anyone involved in a program like this that um, deer can't always be shot um, where they're seen. It depends a lot on uh, visibility, whether a safe um, uh, kill shot is available. And in terms of Manningham, because we've got a lot of smaller properties, uh, a lot of the re restraint or restrictions are whether the deer is on the property that um, we have all the permits and that are involved in the control program for. So if the deer is in that property or if it's just outside, 
in the adjacent property where a shot can't be taken. I'll just move on um, to this next um, graph. So um, this is about deer sightings and it's a it's a rationalised perspective of um, deer that have been captured on our cameras, the images that we've processed. So um, it's a conservative view um, of, of deer image and the images and figures. So what it represents is a total number of fairly unique or what we think are unique deer sightings of around 4,200 deer images um, being from August 2017 to June 2020. So there's we've got a lot more data which um, we've collected and he's been worked through at the moment. So we're, we're only to June 2020, um, 2020, sorry, but uh, there's um, it takes a little bit of time to work through the data. So um, the reason I sort of mentioned this as being rationalized or a conservative view is basically to avoid the potential of recounting the same deer across multiple cameras. Uh, Arta, our land care coordinator has taken the approach where he splits um, the entire study area into four areas, these being uh, three areas within the control um, site and Warren Wood Reserve. So what he's done is he's taken all of the um, deer image counts and then he's only taken the highest deer count across all cameras per area per day, uh, resulting in this graph. So if you're in one area and it has uh, eight cameras in it, he'll just take the highest number of deer from just one of the cameras for a, for a single day, um, hoping not to uh, count deer more than once. Um, the reason behind this uh, is to try to avoid getting um, uh, an over um, estimation of deer numbers. Um, so also thinking about this graph, you can see that it's fairly evident and you know, with the graph I showed beforehand of you know contractor visiting um, and uh, deer being seen and killed, um, uh, you, you can see that there's definitely uh, a fluctuation um, in numbers over time so that, that they are going up and down. But even though we're having a fairly consistent shooting program, the deer numbers keep coming back. Uh, in particular, I mean, if you have a look at this blue line, you know, deer numbers in this area really picked up um, drastically. So in terms of our monitoring program, we're finding that cameras are a good start and are a very useful way to help determine the effectiveness of our deer program as they're giving us an idea of deer presence uh, and an indication of numbers over time. But I think for anyone thinking about a monitoring program, it should be noted that cameras won't tell you how much damage deer are causing um, and they won't tell you the changes to vegetation structure and cover in our natural areas, uh, which is the main question we want to know uh, for our project and in Manningham and for yeah, impacts to our uh, biodiversity. So um, that is why we do vegetation monitoring and why it's so important. So that's my little segue into my next um, uh, uh, slot, which is um, discussing the vegetation monitoring side of the program. Sam, do you want to pause? We've got a few questions for you and Tracy about your program um, before we go into the veg monitoring. Yeah, no worries, that's fine. All right. So, um, how many deer have you culled and what process do you use for the carcasses? All right, let's uh, go back to our other graph. Um, so we've culled um, 254 deer within sort of the bounds of um, that uh, timeline of our project. Mm -hmm. This is across Manningham area. And so the contractor, um, I'm not sure about the very initiation of the program years ago, but uh, the deer are taken to a, um, a abattoir and meat processing facility. Great. And what is the current cost per deer for your uh, whole process? Uh, for the whole process, in um, let's. Uh, I can probably answer that in terms um, a bit of a ballpark figure uh, about the control program, more so than when the project was set up initially. So there were probably additional costs in. Um, uh, having a, uh, a methodology and a protocol developed and setting up all of the plots. But I think, and Tracy might correct me if I'm wrong, it's sort of low 200s uh, perhaps 
Yeah, yeah. we did. We, we did the figures, yes. I think Manningham Council paid for um, the expertise and the time that the ladies put into developing the program. Um, but just as far as our landholder participants are concerned, yes, yeah, Sam, we did, we did the figure and it was low $200 per deer, around $240, $250 per deer. So it's quite an expensive thing, although some people in the group, when I did that, they said it wasn't, that was, that was cheap. <laughs> <laughs> it's all relative, right? Mm, the, the challenge we have is we're on, like I mentioned, um, and we're on small, you know, much smaller properties. We're not on big rural properties with, you know, perhaps um, tens or hundreds of deer moving through each night where, you know, sometimes contractors can um, really uh, go to town and, and shoot a lot of deer. So it's challenging. And based on your monitoring program, so you've showed us roughly, you know, your, your deer counts, um, mm -hmm. but are you able to extrapolate from those camera photos approximately where they're harbouring or moving to or herd sizes or is that too detailed? That's that's uh, it's a good question um, and it's a great question. It's something we are interested in as well and something we want to know and um, we can't uh, gather that from our data. Our data is sort of basically the camera data is just giving us um, an insight into the relative numbers that we're capturing. So fluctuations over time in deer numbers, we're seeing more or you're seeing less, but um, there are genetic studies going on um, in conjunction with DELB and uh, La Trobe University and others where um, uh, um, deer samples are collected, including by our contractor, and um, they're trying to do genetic studies to figure out you know, where deer uh, are coming from, like perhaps um, the populations have come from Gippsland or they're moving across and uh, potentially um, at some point it'll give us an idea of, of numbers, um, but no, I can't answer that, Steph. Thank you. And this is from uh, Kimberly from Delp. She raises a, a very valid point. What's your approach to communicating and engaging with members of the community, particularly those who may oppose the program? Well, I suppose I can answer that. Um, it's like any program that you get with pest uh, animals. <laughs> um, people uh, need just to be educated and exposed to the facts, learn, learn about the deer problem. Um, but of course, when I first moved here 20 years ago and someone asked me to be involved in a rabbit baiting program, I said, no way, I'm not involved in that sort of thing. I don't want to kill, kill creatures. Um, the deer program is, is so much more severe. So there are a lot of people who um, won't uh, participate or who haven't been um, approached the right way or, or, or whatever. But, um, and uh, for example, neither of my, my neighbours is in the program and yet my neighbours across the road are. Um, we just have to go along and do our best. Um, conversely, there are people in the program who never have shooting on their program on their properties because their properties are very I'm unsafe. Very yeah. yeah, so they just, oh, I've got some feedback all of a sudden. I better stop talking. Can I just jump in, uh, Steph, as well? I mean, there's lots of really great um, questions here about um, the control programs, but I just wanted to remind people that tonight's about monitoring and identification. So we do have sessions coming up that are about um, control programs, working with your neighbours to do control, and uh, even one in two weeks' time that um, Richard will be talking about where we're just talking specifically about shooting and shooting alone, all the different methods, hunting versus culling versus recreational shooting. Um, so that's the best forum for those conversations. I think let's just focus on our ID and veg monitoring, if that's okay. Um, and also, I know you want to plug your services. Um, we do have a deer directory that we're planning, and I'll talk about that later. So um, please refrain from sharing your business details. We know you want to help, and that's great. Um, so that's my two cents. And yes, there was were the similar comments uh, about Nilambix program. Yes, we are running programs. It's around the same cost. Again, all about efficiency but um, and productivity. But we'll talk about that in a session that's focused on shooting, if that's cool with everybody. 
<laughs> so Steph, if there's any other questions that are related to um, monitoring and uh, the camera trapping so far, that'd be great. Uh, just one, uh, are the deer breeding locally or are they migrating from other areas? Why is there no attrition in numbers? And Sam, you did mention the um, DNA monitoring, um, but any other comment on that? Um, yeah, look, I think a, a comprehensive um, study into the genetics and population sizes um, will reveal more information. So sometimes deer populations are considered at quite a, a large um, meta level. So, you know, in Manningham, you know, we're just looking at maybe like a small part of the range of a, of a deer population. So um, deer breed, like Michelle had a little graph at the very start of her presentation and they, um, uh, they're very good at breeding and their numbers are exponentially increasing and they're, you know, moving down from Queensland and New South Wales and across from Gippsland and, you know, they're coming in from all different areas and they're just um, working their way through new territory. So they're just replenishing themselves from, um, you know, wherever they've uh, come from and wherever they've got large populations. So they'll continue to move in from the Yarra Ranges and down from King Lake and places like that. And yeah, um, they're hard to stop. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, yep, yeah, ready for veg monitoring now. No worries. Thanks. Um, okay. So look, I'm just going to give a, a bit of an idea, uh, discuss the, the veg monitoring just to give everyone a bit of um, information about what it entails and the data uh, we're trying to capture with, with our project in particular. So that's just a picture of a deer exclosure plot being built. Um, looks pretty shiny. Uh, and um, here's another picture of a deer exclosure at our reference site. So um, it just gives you sort of context of um, you know what they look like and how big they are in the landscape. Um, so with regard to the setup and the methodology, uh, as um, was previously mentioned, um, there are 40 permanent um, 10 metre by 10 metre vegetation plots across the treatment and reference sites uh, that we survey each year. So we've got 20 across private land in our control site and 20 within our reference site at Warrenwood Reserve. And there are two types of plots. Um, We've got our exclosure plots, which are fenced plots, as you can see, uh, and they only allow access to native herbivores. So there's a bit of space underneath, um, although I wouldn't expect a kangaroo to be able to get under, but wallabies um, and other um, native animals should be okay. Um, so they let those uh, native herbivores in, but they exclude deer. Uh, and we've also got um, open plots and they're just open as it sounds, and they allow all uh, herbivores to access um, the plot. So by having those two different types of plots, um, it gives us um, a comparison of the effects of deer browsing. So each of our exclosure plots uh, have a paired with a, a vegetation open plot. And that's just a picture of a, a marker, um, a tagged marker. So that's just a, a corner of one of our open vegetation plots. So it's just a little stake. And yeah, when you're out in the bush and you're trying to, um, on someone's property and in rugged terrain and you're trying to locate that little stake, it can be, it can be quite challenging and fun. Um, so in terms of why and where we have located our vegetation plots and camera traps. So basically um, the number and location of cameras and plots were determined based on us wanting to use ecological vegetation classes as a surrogate for monitoring locations. So um, back in 2017, um, uh, you know, it was thought out that the idea would be um, that we would be able to replicate um, the vegetation communities in both the reference and the control sites across private land um, and in Warrenwood Reserve. And for our study, we chose uh, the EVC's Valley Grassy Forest, um, Creekline Herbridge Woodland and Riparian Forest as these EVCs were seen as the most vulnerable, especially the, the first two I mentioned in terms of their conservation status. Um, and they were also most vulnerable from a deer impact perspective, given it is these creek line and bordering communities that offer the most cover and protection for deer that are moving um, through our landscape and within our study area in Manningham. Let's see what I've got next up. 
So what are we measuring? Um, that's just a picture of uh, part of our data collection sheet. Um, so basically uh, our monitoring is uh, undertaken usually by two, sometimes three people, uh, one person with reasonably good botanical knowledge and uh, one or two helpers is fine. The monitoring is designed to capture key vegetation attributes of growth, regeneration, structure and density. Uh, for growth, we're measuring the vertical growth and browsing damage of key shrub and tree species that appear to be targeted or potentially avoided by deer. And this is assessed each year on tagged plants. So uh, in the very first um, round of surveys, a bunch of plants of certain species and that were certain heights were tagged and measured in terms of their browsing damage and their um, how tall they were. And then each year they're revisited for regeneration, uh, which is a different slide. Um, there's a picture of a tagged plant. So there's a Cassinia aculeata or dogwood, and there's a, looks like a Clematis aristata or something growing up it, but here's a little shrub that was tagged and there's the metal tag down the bottom. So that would have been tagged in year one. And then each year you have to find that plant and um, measure the height and how much it's being browsed. Okay. Uh, for regeneration, so that's basically woody shrub and tree species are assessed by counting stems in age class categories and certain heights to figure out, you know, recruitment and um, regeneration of common woody species. And the third attribute is the measurement of vegetation structure and density. So this is done in two ways. Firstly, by measuring the structure and cover of the shrub layer, because we're quite interested in the shrub layer. And that's how the, the methods were designed by um, the researchers that uh, put it all together for us. Um, so that looks at cover using a cover board and we're also measuring the structure and cover of the ground layer life forms uh, through quadrats throughout the, the plots. Okay. So here's a picture of an open vegetation plot with um, tapes sort of spread out throughout it. So we um, have certain intervals where we're collecting the information and putting quadrats down. So that just gives an idea of what it looks like. So how time consuming are our vegetation surveys? Um, well, the monitoring itself is, is reasonably involved and each plot sort of takes on average anywhere from one and a half to three hours. And that sort of includes locating the plot, um, which might mean walking down to the back of someone's property, um, trying to find the, the marker. Uh, obviously, exclosure plots are the easy ones to find and it's the, the other ones are the hard ones to find. Um, setting up the plot um, and then recording the vegetation data. So um, fairly time consuming and it can be faster or slower depending on things like, yeah, how far you have to walk or how difficult it is to find or the complexity in the vegetation when recording the data. So some um, uh, plots are quite diverse and have a lot of life form layers and some are um, perhaps um, less diverse. Okay. Move on to the next picture. So this is a picture of um, taken from one of the corners of the inside of an exclosure plot. Uh, I think you can see my raincoat hanging up on one of the corners, but and that's sort of what the, the, the structure of the vegetation looks like in this um, exclosure plot. And this next picture is the paired vegetation, like the paired open plot that um, goes with that exclosure plot. So quite different vegetation, but that's not necessarily an indication of what deer have done. At, um, you know, this plot uh, might have looked like this when it was first set up. Um, so it, it plots were randomly located. So it just depended on what the vegetation was like, uh, where the, the plot was positioned. Um, at this stage, we're still in the process of collecting the vegetation data and we haven't yet embarked upon analyzing it as it's it, would be a fairly um, involved statistical exercise and it's likely much better suited to a, a research um, PhD student or the like. So we are in the process of exploring options for this, but um, yes, we haven't uh, crunched the, the stats on the data at this stage. However, anecdotally, um, it's apparent that changes to the mid story and understory shrub layer over time has been significant. So, um, landowners uh, that have uh, observed changes and people within council would have been working in the area for a long time have observed drastic um, 
the, the shrub layer drastically re being reduced from years ago. And, you know, a lot of these changes were already present um, at the inception of the project in 2017. From a very rudimentary scan of the regeneration and growth data that I had a look at um, at the last few years, uh, the trend, uh, I looked at sort of Jumping Creek, not the, um, the reference site. So from a look at the data, it looks like not a lot of a recruitment is occurring in either the open or exclosure plots. But, um, but if there has been any regeneration in the shrub layer, then it's usually in the exclosure plots. And if there um, has been a decrease, then it's usually in the open plots. And for vertical growth and browsing, so those tagged plants, um, not all of the open plots are having losses. Uh, sometimes it might depend on the position of the of where the shrub is, but um, there was very seldom any increase in growth of these shrubs. And uh, for more than half of the open plots, there looks to be a, a general trend of plant death or loss after the initial survey, whether by deer or not. Um, you know, it's not always 100% known, but um, where plants have been surviving and in these examples, uh, they've been heavily browsed, so they're, they're not getting any taller. And if anything, a lot of them are getting shorter. So uh, just a picture of some data for fun. Um, basically, uh, just to finish off, I was just going to give a bit of a take home message um, about what is the purpose of monitoring? You know, why are we, why are we thinking about that? Um, so from our perspective, the whole purpose of monitoring deer presence and capturing this data over time through camera traps and vegetation monitoring is to assist in measuring the effectiveness of our control program in reducing deer numbers. So um, without monitoring the presence and impact of deer over time, I guess I ask you, how do you accurately gauge the success of a deer control program? So the purpose of capturing data is to measure indications of deer numbers and changes in vegetation condition. Um, to help determine at what point deer control is most needed rather than just in anecdotal form. So sometimes this, I guess, can take a, a long period of time or a number of years. Um, but an example is, you know, if you're doing a monitoring program and you're not noticing any deer presence or changes in vegetation structure, then perhaps um, control in your area is not as important at that time. However, if you are noticing an increase in numbers in vegetation changes over time, then this information can be used to help determine the need for control and or the effectiveness of the program that you're running or perhaps changes that you might need to um, take for your control program. Um, and I'll probably just finish up there. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. That was great. No worries. I'll just, I'll just uh, stop sharing. One second. Okay. So Mike asks, do you have a technique for separating out deer versus macropod damage? Uh, is the relative number seen by camera trap help in differentiating that? I think um, in general, when you're looking at the um, species that have been browsed, I mean, I guess Richard touched on it a little bit with the, how um, plants are browsed and how things are chewed. So it's not always that easy when you're looking at little things um, to tell whether a deer's had a nibble or whether it's been nibbled by a wallaby per se. But um, uh, with the methodology, we're more just giving it a, a score of how heavily browsed it is rather than trying to um, differentiate that. Um, yeah, so it's not, you can do it, but it's probably um, easier on the bigger plants where it's much more evident. Very good. And uh, can you comment on the impact of deer on native daisies, peas and orchids? Native daisies, peas and orchids. Um, the good things we like to look at when we're out in the field. <laughs> um, in terms of our plots, um, I can't comment too much about uh, preferences that deer have for those things. However, um, you know, with orchids, if, if they're in line with um, anywhere where deer are trampling and causing wallows and things like that, obviously it's going, going to be an issue. We're looking also, our, you know, our study areas are not 
in as drier or open vegetation. So we haven't noticed a lot of orchids and things like that present, but they will um, have a munch on uh, anything woody. So peas would definitely be in their, in their range. Yeah. And can you comment on the um, browsing preferences of deer in your plots and, and their species selection? I can a little bit. So, um, I mean, I touched on trends that I looked at in terms of the data um, where open plots were being a lot more browsed. But when the, the project was set up, I think, you know, a lot of browsing had already uh, been happening. So the, the shrub cover had already been reduced quite significantly. Um, in our plots, you know, favourite species and species that are looked at a lot, uh, but favourite species of deer are definitely Berseria, Spinosa and your Cassinias, um, you know, they'll be chewing any sort of, they don't really uh, hit the eucalypts as hard, but they'll be chewing um, lots of other uh, things that um, are tasty. Almost, I guess I could just say everything, whether it's weed or native, um, they're, they're generally eating it if if they're hungry and if they're if there's lots of food around, um, they do preference certain things. Um, like Cassinias and Berserias and Pomodorus and um, sometimes uh, Sweet Potosporum and things like that. Yeah, and with your with the control program in Manningham, have most of your successful um, deer shoots been at a, a, a small selection of properties within your total um, range, or are you? Um, shooting fairly evenly across your properties. Tracy, Tracy, oh yeah, we, we have eight um, areas um, that some prop some have uh, two or three or four properties in them, the clusters, and uh, others might have one or two big prop bigger properties in them. It um, because it's all voluntary. It, yes, it is spread around around our catchment area. Um, there are clusters, as uh, we've noted, eight, and um, they're all very very different. Um, and again, it's um, it's it's just sort of a program, a cull and monitoring program, uh, established for uh, in using the best scientific practice that they had four years ago. Um, somebody wrote that they feel it's it's clearly not working. Well, I hope I didn't give that impression. It's an experiment. It's set up. We're trying something. It's being funded. We're doing it properly, all best practice to the best of our ability. And um, we're the first of our kind. And I, I wouldn't say that it's, it's clearly not working. Sure, we're facing a uh, almost losing battle in terms of the dribbling in of deer constantly, constantly, but we're doing our best. So I and I, I don't think it is clearly not working. No. <laughs> um, can I ju jump in, Tracy? Just um, something a little bit interesting uh, when the program was set up, but um, the one of the features of the monitoring control program uh, with the control side is um, and the theory from the researchers that put it together is you know a lot of people think that shooting and killing is the way you get rid of deer so we need to get people out there and when when i don't mean i don't mean the only way to reduce the population i mean if you're wanting to remove them from an area so yes you have to kill them to <laughs> to reduce the population. But if you've got an area, um, the theory is uh, a, a constant presence of um, people undertaking control in an area, whether they're always killing the deer or not, um, is thought to help reduce uh, the behavior of the deer. So they might not travel through the same areas. They might travel around them or they might um, disperse to other areas. So that's um, part of Part of the program is about having a constant presence across the study area. Now, in theory, that's fairly straightforward and simple, but in practice, you can't always have people on the ground in all of the places, you know, frequently twice a week or once a week all the time. So um, it's, you know, it's one of those difficult things where when you put a program into practice, you you notice that it's, it's, it's not that simple and, you know, it costs money too, so. Mm, we have people who who does what the uh, the, sh the uh, shooter to walk their property. He, they don't want shooting on their property, but um, it's uh, it's probably they think it's better than better than nothing. 
Have you noticed in your plots changes in the composition of weeds based on deer impacts? <laughs> oh, I, um, they look only one comment on that would be um, they do like to browse blackberry. So um, sometimes in our exposure plots where there's blackberry, it's uh, increasing and um, we have to manually control it in there uh, before it takes over, which it can do very quickly. And outside of the plots, um, sometimes the deer are having a good good munch and are, are naturally um, helping <laughs> reduce it. Deer are what we call opportunistic browsers and grazers. They, they graze and they browse and they strip whole, whole areas. They, they don't just eat the tender things, they <laughs> strip it. <laughs> mm. There's been some really interesting studies too on the um, distribution of weed seeds by the deer. So they may browse them and keep them sort of in check, but they also can spread seeds and they've studied the types of species that are produced from that. And it's weed plants as well as native plants. It's a whole range of things. Um, so they, they could be vectors of, of weed spread to other areas also. Okay, good. Well, we are up to date with questions, so please keep sending them in. Is there anything else, Michelle, you want to touch on? No, that sounds great. Um, again, lots of great questions that I think are probably um, best kept for some of the other sessions. Um, our working relationship with GMA and DELP um, and also ADA and Sporting Shooters Association, we, uh, or Nellabic certainly is uh, working with those organisations to try and um, get some better results. Um, we haven't yet, as yet found um, much being offered, shall we say, in terms of monitoring data. Um, and I'm not sure that the GMA would uh, collect that. The information that we'd be looking for um, might be harvesting data and so forth, but um, I suspect nothing particularly local to our area because it's very little recreational hunting allowed. So. Um, they're certainly aware of our programs, um, but haven't reached out to us to offer assistance, shall we say. Um, OK, so if we are up to date with questions, that probably means that I am good to go on to my um, next section. And OK, so I just wanted to cover um, oops, can you see my screen? No. Ah, negative. negative. Okay, let me try that again. Um, screen. There we go. That looks better. And how about that? Perfect. Great. Okay. Um, so, yes, yeah, Sam and his crew at Jumping Creek Catchment have um, done some really specific on-site uh, monitoring programs. Um, Nillambic is yet to start any formal programs like that, so we're looking at some other um, more fluid options, shall we say. So, um, one of the techniques we use to find out whether we've got deer is the record of complaints. Um, people are always calling um, to let me know that they've got deer and what sort of damage they're having. Sometimes they're seeking help, sometimes they're just um, having a bit of a whinge or letting me know and that's totally fine. So we monitor the number of complaints and see whether those complaints are increasing or decreasing over time and where they might be and uh, take some notes on what sort of damage they're um, having on their properties and what sort of numbers they're seeing as well. Um, the other uh, avenue we use to monitor deer numbers, and I suppose it relates to what Manningham are doing, is, is um, doing control programs and seeing whether that impacts the numbers. So our controllers, uh, Richard is one of those, and we have another company as well. Uh, they are out monthly, a couple of nights a month, two to three nights a month perhaps, um, and so they're noticing the change in number of deer that they're seeing while they're doing the control efforts. And as per Manningham, they record the number of deer that are um, removed from the sites and also those that they see but were unable to be um, removed. So um, we're, we're looking at the number of sightings, but also just trying to work out whether they the deer are moving to other locations or they're becoming skittish. We have heard reports of them just moving to the other side of the road, which is a good reason to have really um, big landscape 
scale projects so that you are covering more area and you aren't just getting localised decreases, but then just shifting the problem somewhere else. Uh, there are some other much more complicated techniques like uh, collaring of deer and tracking where they move um, using microchips. Oh, don't ask me. It's, it's very complicated, um, but getting a collar on a deer is a uh, challenge in itself. There are projects that look at eDNA, as Sam mentioned, so they can tell genetic differences between the deer or similarities more so, so they can tell whether a deer in this particular location uh, is related to deer at other locations so you can get an idea of where they might be moving to. Um, they, they do samples of hair and blood and feces and all sorts of things, um, but it's a very complicated process and is probably best left to um, professional researchers. Uh, drones were touched on and as Tracy said, they are not necessarily great for thick vegetation areas. And um, in Nilambic, they're probably the areas that we're most interested in getting information about and certainly for council in terms of conservation reserves. So um, we are looking into it um, and yeah, trying to weigh up some of the options for what might work for Nilambic. Um, Drones can be used in areas that helicopters can't. However, helicopters can cover more area um, and are actually cheaper per area than a drone. There's a whole range of, of factors to weigh up as to whether they um, are suitable for your area. But um, as an example, um, the Chase Reserve and Professors Hill Reserve in North Warrandyte, they cover about 300 hectares. Um, we've been given quotes for around two and a half thousand to five and a half thousand per night um, and that might um, only cover um, around um, 250 hectares. So we could get that done in a night, but it would cost us two and a half grand and they're very small reserves. So if you're looking to extrapolate that over a whole council area, it becomes um, almost cost prohibitive, um, but then you'd be wanting to weigh up your options as to whether drones are um, a good option versus on ground techniques that perhaps you could use some volunteers for. Um, and certainly for Nell and Bick, we'd be wanting to then focus on areas that are a bit more open so that you could actually get some um, good um, photographic images. Having said that, um, this is an example of a little drone and a deer sighting using that drone um, and there's another one here. These are horses um, oops, over here, um, through some fa fairly thick vegetation and this one here is actually a control program. So this is a, an operation that is uh, shooting from a helicopter. This is what they're seeing through the camera um, and this is what they're seeing through the canopy. So as you can see, you can't see the animal at all, but uh, using their spiffy technology, they can tell exactly that that deer is at that location and actually undertake a control program that way. So it's fairly impressive technology, um, just difficult to um, um, get all the uh, privacy concerns, I suppose, in place. I think people are a little bit concerned if they had a drone flying over their house that they could pick up identifying information. But as you can see from these images, um, they really are just white blobs or coloured blobs and certainly no identifying features. But um, Council is mindful of the perception of landholders and we'll be working through that before we undertook any, any program within Nillambic. Um, other so, uh, techniques that you can think about are actually walking transect lines and counting your scats or pellets, um, damage to trees um, and monitoring trails, tracks, hair, fence damage and vegetation damage. So I guess we're looking for um, some similar things that um, Manningham and Jumping Creek are doing in their um, vegetation plots. So looking at the damage to the vegetation, but instead walking um, transect lines. So just walking um, along prescribed uh, direction and counting um, scats on either side of that transect. But once you've actually recorded all that information of how many scat you've counted. Uh, there's some, some very complex uh, statistic modelling to actually work out the abundance from that uh, and that is something that I would leave to a university or professionals that are really great with statistics because it's quite complicated. Um, it's possible we might be able to hear from um, someone from Parks Vic if they're here tonight who might be able to tell us more about how that works. 
Um, but suffice to say, even walking transect and noting whether you have scats or you don't have scats is still indicative of the fact you've got deer on site. So uh, Nilambic is developing a monitoring protocol for use on our reserves or private properties and we're trying to do something really basic um, and we just want to ascertain whether the control that we're undertaking is actually reducing deer activity at a property or landscape level and does a reduction in deer activity or sightings equate to a reduction in the damage that we're seeing in the vegetation. Um, being mindful, of course, that it does take some time for plants to recover. So uh, once you've removed the deer from an area, it might take some time before you see that the vegetation is recovering. Uh, so our monitoring protocol, as I said, is very basic. You simply walk a 100 metre transect. Um, it's been suggested we walk along a creek line and recall the number of pellets and tree rubbings that are present within two metres to the left and right of the transect. And in terms of um, vegetation damage, we will select the first 10 shrubs that we encounter on the transect and record the proportion of the stems on it each um, below two metres that have been browsed. So what percentage has um, of the trees has been browsed? Um, got a um, copy of the data sheet that we put forward just with some samples of what sort of pellets we would include or not include based on um, how they have um, disintegrated over time. And then some indications of what the rubs look like when you're out in the field. So um, I actually have had a bit of a try of walking around and um, trying this process out. I did find that I did not find a lot of deer damage when I was walking that transect, although over the property as a whole, I did find signs. So um, for those that are wanting to try this out on their own property, um, I'd probably recommend uh, finding scat piles marking where those are and then returning to those locations on a, a regular basis to see whether those areas are still having signs of scats um, because they do tend to defecate in similar locations each time um, and so that's one way of tracking whether you are still getting presence um, uh, as an example, we, we've been doing some control work on a property and the landholder has um, promised us <laughs> that since doing control works, that hit the tracks that he was seeing that are actually crossing the Yarra because the deer do travel between Manningham and Nillambic across the river. Uh, the trails that were leading into the river used to be just a mess of, of um, hoof prints and you couldn't tell how many there were because it was a mess and now you see just one or two prints so we're down to very small numbers of deer which is, is great. So that's in totally indicative. So um, we will give this a go, this process, um, but as, as Sam said, it's, it's a time consuming process to go out there and takes a lot of time if you're wanting to cover a lot of properties. So um, we highly encourage landholders to do some of these um, monitoring techniques themselves um, and record the data and pass that on to us and share that so that we can uh, get a better picture of what is happening across Nellenbeek. How often you should re um, record data is well, it's a bit tricky. I, I just recommend you record every deer that you see um, when you see it. Um, but as a minimum, I would say a seasonal survey to see whether your property has deer, um, you know, in summer, autumn, winter and spring to see whether there are changes over time. Um, and I think the, the easiest way of recording data is through deer scan. Uh, if we have time, I can run through it, but it's really very basic. Um, and you can be assured that the data is quite confidential. The map of Australia here is as far as you can zoom in to see all the records that have been collected by other people. Um, as a Council Biodiversity offer, Officer, I do actually have access to the data. So even while we've been speaking, people have been sending in deer scan records, which is awesome. So they pop up on my phone um, and I'm able to track where across Nillenbeek we are seeing sightings. So this um, <clears throat> map on the right is showing sightings, which are the red dots, uh, damage records, which are orange and control sites, um, most of which are our 
council control programs. So you can see they're pretty much spread all across um, council and there'd be a lot of people who aren't recording. So it can be a little biased to um, people who are having issues in their property and they get their neighbours together and record deer. So you get these sort of localised clusters of, of data which might not be representative of how they actually are spread all across um, the council area. Oops. Okay, so that is all I had as well. So um, I had probably pressed the wrong button there, so hopefully I can exit out of this and stop screen Michelle, sharing. Well. Yep. You're still screen sharing. Yeah. I'm just trying to get into the screen where I can unshare. I press the wrong button at the wrong time, as you do. Has it. There we go. Um, so in the last 12 months, how many DIS um, sightings have you received by a feral scan? Oh, I have. I did actually put that data on another PowerPoint because I thought I might be asked that. I actually don't think I've got the information for just the last 12 months. Um, let's just see if I can. Oh, wrong one. I will find the data in a minute. Oh, way over there. All right. Um, as I said, it's it's limited to how many people actually submit the data. So let's have a look. Do, do, do. Ask me another question while I'm finding it. Huh. Here we go. Um, this period, um, 343 individual sightings of deer um, and 610 deer recorded from that. Oh, year to date, 24 sightings of deer um, and 26 individual deer, um, which is not a huge amount. So I really would encourage people to record those. You might think if you recorded them once, then we know the deer are there and so we don't need to record it again. No, please record it. Um, some great uh, landholders out there that record the honks, that record the damage that will record everything they um, hear and see. And that is fantastic because it means that we know, particularly if it's one of our control areas, a bit like the camera traps, we know there's deer there and we know it's there now. And that really helps with um, yeah, getting our control program uh, up and running. I could share this little graph of how the sightings have, have bu bumped up and down over time, but um, it's pretty obvious that I've had peaks in recordings when I've had uh, these information sessions. So people think about it and then they forget again. <laughs> Great. Um, we've got a question for one of the, our councillors, but um, I'm not sure if the councillor is here tonight, so maybe we can take that offline to Ben. Thanks, Benu. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions? Well, that'd be easy. No others came through. I must have been so straightforward. Lots of comments. It's been a very <laughs> active chat. It's hard to, I, I hope I haven't lost any questions. It's all right. I can hear things. Oh, yes, yes. I don't know if that's... Um, uh, let me have it as well. Uh, uh, Mike, there are currently 35 people in the meeting, if that helps you. We had, Do you want to give a little intro for your next uh, webinar coming up? Yeah, that's why I was supposed to stop sharing. That was... Um, <laughs> two seconds. Sorry, Mike actually means how many guests on Feral Scan as a platform? Oh, I don't know and um, some people can record um, their sightings privately so um, I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, thanks for the whistle. Um, 
No, I don't know. There, there probably is a way of working out how many individual people are signed up to it. Um, you can set up your own little group if you've got a little community that is wanting to just share data with each other. Uh, you can set it up so the data is shared just to your little group, but I highly recommend um, making it public. As I said, it's not public for um, like I can zoom into my records, but I can't zoom into other people's records if I'm just logged in as myself. Um, so that means that people can't identify your property and go, oh, there's a deer there. I'm going to go out and try and shoot it. So that's why I'm saying it's it's very safe way to record the data. Um, and yeah, I know um, Feral Scan are, are very mindful of privacy and are not making that for the public. Um, yeah, so where to next? We do have um, a, a lot more sessions to come. Um, but probably one of the first things I would say is that we are running some site visits and property assessments um, to those that are having some real issues with deer. And we're particularly looking for groups of neighbours who are willing to actually work together. Um, and so we can come out, we can bring a one of our contractors with us. We might be able to bring the district uh, divisional, sorry, firearms officer with us as well, just to make sure that it is a property that is safe to shoot at. Um, and so if you are interested in working with your neighbours, we have a session that is entitled pretty much that, working with your neighbours. And um, that's on Wednesday, the 14th of April. Um, and so that will help you with working out how to best go about coordinating works and, and costs. Um, and we do have um, Jumping Creek catchment again. So they'll talk about how they brought all the landholders together. So those who are interested in in how many landholders you need and how you get them together and how the cost is shared that we can we'll go into that in quite a lot of detail uh, if you think that shooting or control of deer removal of deer is an option then we have a session on shooting in peri-urban areas and that's on in two weeks th uh, 31st of march again 7 till 9 pm um, we are hoping that we can assist you financially through our land management incentive program. Our current control programs are grant funded, so we're always looking for future grant programs to um, assist us in, in financing some deer control, which will enable us to get a professional in who might be able to remove more deer than a recreational hunter that might just want to um, fill his fridge and that's it, but we can discuss that in more detail. Um, and we are putting together a deer directory, as I mentioned earlier. So for those who are wanting to get in touch with a local hunter or for hunters that want to help out with control, we are putting together um, a directory and I recommend that people sign up to our industry mailing list. I've got that um, in the next slide, but also I'll send it out in the um, post event survey just to give you the details for that direct um, mailing list and so we'll have a session that is just for uh, shooters, hunters, hunting groups um, and others that want to be on a directory just to talk about what our requirements for being on that directory are. So we're just we're still finalising those requirements. Uh, we've also got a whole range of fact sheets and resources that we are finalising, which will go on our council website, and that includes um, some flyers on identifying deer. So those things that we've talked about tonight will be in a little fact sheet for you. Um, and the other thing to know is that you know Council uh, Nillambic and Manningham are not the only councils working on deer management and control. There's a whole um, network of people that are seeking to um, bring more research together and organise more collaborative work across um, all land tenures. Uh, so we've got the Victorian Community Deer Network and I may not have that name right because I think it changed recently but that will be launched shortly. Uh, a peri-urban regional deer action action plan, so peri-urban deer action plan is being developed by DELP. That's as, um, uh, because the Victorian Deer Control Strategy came out and that said that we would have to develop some action plans and there is a peri-urban one being developed straight off the bat. So that will um, be really informative uh, and hopefully um, prioritise some areas of control. Uh, we have the Invasive Species Council who've got a new stemming deer project officer, Peter Jacobs. So he'll be working on raising awareness of deer across, that's across Victoria. And we also have a national feral deer program uh, led by Annalise Weebkin. Um, and that is, oh, she's 
a jack of all trades, but she'll be looking at um, research, partnerships, grant funding, just everything you can think of. And so she'll be making that information available to all of us through a website that will be set up soon. So I highly encourage you to um, stay on board and find out all the details about those programs as they come up. So here's all of our programs. Um, if you bought your ticket on Eventbrite tonight and there's a button to follow council, you'll be able to see all these sessions um, there for you to book into. It'd be great for you to come along. Um, so shooting, managing deer with your neighbours, uh, the technology, you can come along and see what it looks like through a thermal monocular and um, infrared scope, which our um, shooters use on, on our control projects. Um, we The property management options to reduce Dear damage um, that is going to be presented by Richard also. Um, and so he's going to be talking about non lethal control methods because I know that's really important to people. So, fencing and um, uh, deterrence. Uh, somebody mentioned that before, so that might be sound. There might be habitat modification. There's a whole range of different things that you can try um, that will keep deer damage to a minimum might not um, remove deer from the landscape, but will keep them out of your property. Um, and we will be having some uh, on ground sessions, as I said. So anyone who's interested in actually seeing some of these signs in the flesh, um, I have a whole range of little sample bottles with um, poo and hair and um, other thing, fun things which are best seen in person, but um, there's a few sites around we can have a walk and actually see things um, on the ground and that's very helpful. So um, yeah, let me know if you're interested in those. Um, and finally, the deer control market. So once we've got our deer directory up and running, you can come and meet those hunters that are on that list. And I should say it's not just hunters, it might be people that run drone surveys and so forth. And um, you can meet them and talk about your property and see whether they might work for you. Um, our deer survey is still happening. Um, our web page um, has a lot of information on it and will be updated shortly uh, with the video from tonight. And we've also got those mailing lists, which many of you might already be on. Um, but for those interested in providing services, you want that industry mailing list. So uh, I think that is probably um, the last slide I've got. Um, so really just want to say uh, thanks everyone for attending. I can see it is uh, now nine o'clock, so I do want to uh, wrap it up. Um, and unless there's any other questions that have come in, Steph? Nope, we're up to date. Sweet, that is so good. Great timing. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for attending, for Steph for managing the chat and the questions so beautifully, and to our awesome guests, Richard Francis, Sam Gilbert and Tracy Wood. I'm sure we'll be seeing them at other sessions as well. And we look forward to seeing you at future sessions um, or on your property. So get in touch with me. OK. And thank you, Michelle. You are wonderful. <laughs> oh, that's very sweet of you to say. <laughs> um, and so I think, whoops, I don't need to be showing you that. Um, we can probably call it a night. So um, thanks, everyone, for coming. And um, we'll see you at the, at the next session, yeah? See you. Thanks, Michelle. No worries. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Bye, everyone. Sounds good. Neil. Bye. 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 <laughs> I'll sit here until everyone's logged out.